Professor Murray uh, uh, from the uh, University of California at Irvine. All right, so first uh, I'd like to have a, a late congratulation of the recent opening of the Center for Computational Chemistry uh, at the NYU uh, Shanghai campus. And uh, today, uh, just to, to continue Professor Wu's talk, essentially the session is on force field development. But, but my talk is more uh, slightly different, and it's on basically uh, the salvation part or the continuum part. So basically, I want to highlight you know, how far we can go with uh, the sort of continued representation in the, in the force field development. All right, so uh, since uh, it's a short talk, uh, for the sake of time, I would like quickly uh, acknowledge the people who did the work and the force field actually were involved in the Amber force field consortium and the team of uh, PIs involved in this and it's been uh, seven, eight years and the, the lead PI, Yung Duan from UC Davis and the two is working on small molecule, Pietra is working on nucleic acid and day cases Definitely, the you know some consultant on this, and the salvation is a collaboration with uh, several applied mathematician, you know, both in my campus and, the, and the, on the East Coast. Hong Kai Zhao, former chair of our math department, Zulin Li, the, from North, North Carolina State, and McDuson. Lots of collaboration. Alexi Onufri working on the, the surface uh, surface uh, definition and so on. Boli and Andy McCammon on the sort of latest uh, thing that I'm going to talk about. And all the work uh, is done by, by the current lab, Li Xiao, is basically the thing that I'm going to talk about. His uh, project rests on the other things. And I don't think I have time for that. And also, Chang Hao did some of this uh, thing that on the second top part of this topic. And also, the, the Andrew is actually working on binding as well. All right, so. Uh, since uh, there are so many students here, I, I just want to uh, have a sort of more generic introduction to uh, you know why do we care about water. So the first thing I, you know, in general, right, you know, if you same in uh, Professor Wu's talk, in general, what we care about in this uh, force field development is essentially how to model weak and transit in interactions in biochemistry. And some of the slides actually from my lecture in uh, biochemistry for undergrad. So it basically, you know, I just use that as a you know very uh, sort of introduction for this uh, topic. So uh, if you still remember from your textbook or your former class in the biochemistry, you know that all the biomolecules like proteins and nucleic acid, lipid, you know, carbohydrate, you know, for the most part, they're stabilized by that sort of bond, right? Covalent bond. You know, you have this, the you know, for example, the you know, hydrogen of water, right? You know, they, you have that explosion there, you know, you, you form water. You know, that, the bond you form there is a covalent bond. But for most part, you know, in biochemistry, the most interesting processes really depends on weak interactions, all right? So they're reversible, you know, for example, the sense, you know, visions, all of that, the taste, you know, this depends on reversible uh, weak interactions, you know. Quite often, the, the, the reversibility and just right st strength the amount of that interaction, attraction, are exploited by animals like your geckos, and you, know, you can work on the, on the ceiling. You know, you could not, otherwise it would be stuck there. We're gonna fall off from the wall, right? So we, they just were able to handle that just the right balance. So what kind of weak interaction are there? So you have the sort of strongest one is sort of you know acid-base interaction, plus and minus charge in chemistry, and you have the hydrogen bonding. Fortunately, we don't have a lot in biochemistry. It's only basically. Uh, few types shown here, three types. And also you have generic universal venue interaction shown here, you know, basically between any pair of atoms. So, but my talk today is a more specific, you know, since Professor Wu is more like on all the other weak interaction on proteins, but my part is more on how do we model water, you know, water and salvation. So basically we all know that life as we know it, right, happens in water, at least in, on Earth. So human beings are almost 70% water, babies are over 90% water, all right? So why they're so useful, you know, they, they're excellent solvent, essentially, they render water mobile and permits brown emotions, and which is basically many underlying, the underlying mechanism of many processes in, in your body. So they are also the simplest, you know, chemicals. It's a chemical, unfortunately, right? It's, even if it's really just so safe. It only has three atoms, 
two bound, all right? And one important feature of this is sort of the excellent donor and acceptor of hydrogen bomb, forming the extensive network uh, for certain conditions. So the strength of this hydrogen bomb is, uh, you know, can be used to explain many, uh, like, uh, physiological, you know, uh, properties. For example, the tree height, the limit of the tree height, tree, tree height, like this red wood from California is very high, the highest tree in the, on North, um, in, uh, in the world. So how can you explain that? It's actually the limit of the tree really depends on the hydrogen bomb strength. You know, basically, you know, the reason for that is water needs to be pulled continuously from the root to the tree top, right? So if the bonding is too weak, you cannot sustain a, a column of water in, the, in your tree, right? Tree trunk, right? It's going to just have a gap there, you, know, you can never go to the top. And this just highlighted how important it is to, you know, the accuracy, right? Accuracy is very important in modeling studies of biomolecules. And that's why we care about those accuracy as highlighted by Professor Wustak. Quite often it's just a small change, but you know, that little bit, the last one mile determine maybe 90% of your quality of the model. Alright, so some, something that is very important in my part of the talk is a sort of hydrophobia interaction. Essentially that is part of this ubiquitous interaction uh, in biochemistry due to water. So hydrophobic molecules is, uh, stick together. So we call this hydrophobic effect. You know, basically, what does that mean is that when you have nonpolar solvent, I mean molecules in dissolving water, and each molecule is surrounded by water molecules. They're forming a cage, and then they're ordered. Okay, oh sorry. And you know, if they're uh, 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 touching each other, basically they, they aggregate together. The number of order molecules will be reduced. Oh, do I have a here. So there are less, you know, less uh, outer molecules involved in, in sort of caging the, the, the aggregate. Therefore, you know, the orderness the of the system reduced, right? You know, this is basically an entropy driven process, right? You know, the it, entropy is increasing uh, since you have less orderness in the system, right? Why this is this important? Actually, folding is important, right? It's driven by hydrophobia effect. It's also the dri uh, driving force in the membrane formation. So, so apparently, you know, proper computational modeling of uh, biomolecules uh, would involve water molecules. Right? I'm not trying to uh, show you the, the actual force field, and then, you know, basically there are lots of numbers involved, and it painstakingly calibrated, <laughs> tested, and, uh, you know, make sure you do all the work as in the Professor Wu's talk, you know, lots of properties has to be reproduced, so we have of that, some of that. And uh, you have to use lots of those uh, water molecules in your simulation, and in fact, they often overwhelm. Uh, in the typical, basically, overwhelm the number of uh, solute atoms you know, in the typical simulation. And if you are going to do it properly, meaning that you know you're not trying to cut corner. So some people try to cut corner, cut corner right? in the early days. They're trying to reduce the number of water in the simulation, and, but you know none of that really survive. You know over. 20 some years of uh, development, you know, also due to the you know, computational advancement. So the, 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 the question, the, the very legitimate question is, how do you really going to reduce the degrees of freedom? You know? And you want to do it properly? Okay, if, okay. So there are some actually guidelines here. Okay, if you only care about equilibrium properties of a you know, biomolecular system, you know, the first thing that you can think about is the stem map. You know, you're trying to make, make sure that your Distribution is correctly reproduced when you're doing all sorts of approximation here. And this, what is the first principle approximation is basically the distribution. So suppose you have a distribution in the original all atom simulation, you know, everything included, waters, proteins, and so on. And you have a distribution here, and basically this R, U, and V are essentially all the positions. And you want to actually, for, you have a model that is going to throw away all the uh, water <coughs> Degrees of freedom, so there's only R U here, and you want them to be the same, right? So it's possible to do it if you introduce the auxiliary function it's called potential mean force. You know, we're loosely speaking, it we call it continuous solvation free energy. So if you define that way, you will get an exact matching between these two configuration distribution. If you're concerned about uh, the solute or protein only. But this is a, you know, just a very simple or identical mathematical uh, transformation here, and it's very hard to compute. 
So they essentially call for some model like a rhythm, you know, in the integral theorem, you're trying to really try to integrate that under certain approximation, you can do it, and you know, uh, using a certain uh, like a pairwise or tri triplet approximation. But it's, anyway, uh, very difficult to compute in general. So in this study, we're trying to do something that is more tractable, and you know, this uh, how we're going to do it, it will become clear. But before we do that, let's just uh, talk about some big picture thing. You know, how would you use this kind of simple model? In, uh, in dynamics, or in dynamic simulation, or in conformational sampling. Right? So that is actually the thing that I want to talk about first, and it's also relatively new. Okay, so if you happen to uh, take some class in this uh, field, you know that if you want to model uh, the realistic time scale in some uh, potential mean force model, reduced model, meaning that you're not considering all the degrees of freedom in the system, you want to use like a line drawing dynamic or Brownian dynamic, right? This is how you should do it. And uh, it's really a very simple change from the uh, Newtonian equation. You know, if you just look at the first two terms, that's basically Newtonian sec Newton's second law of motion there. What's, what's different here is just like the first is the dragging force because you know your molecules or atoms are moving in water. It's really not something just energetic. You know, you're, you're some mechanical issue there since the water molecule has a mass, right? So you have to, they have a dragging force. The dragging force is all, often the model that is linearly proportional to the, to the velocity of that object, the solid, and you also have a random, you know, stochastic bombardment of water, that, you know. That's the thing that is not part of this uh, equilibrium picture shown here. So, so that is essentially your land-driven dynamic, and the gamma is actually used for both of these two terms. There are very key parameter in this, Okay, so that is Landry dynamic. Okay, so if if you if you have no acceleration, you know, in the in the process, that means what that apparently there's always an acceleration in the in the molecular system. What does that mean is that if your if your time resolution, your integration of your dynamic is so long, like picosecond, you know, since I care about a millisecond or longer, like in the enzyme, you know, why try to do the on and off rate? How would you do it? You are you doing femtosecond? That's gonna be <laughs> Billions or trillions of times that it's just too much, right? You know, also you have to run like many, many thousands of copies. How would you do that? So you cannot do it in all atom simulation. You use Brownian dynamic. Okay? That means that you know I, I, I usually have a very long time step. So when, when you have a long time step, what you have here is essentially the the, the sort of the spontaneous acceleration is no longer important. That means this, you know, you just set that acceleration to zero, and you, you solve the sort of the, the rest of it. It's just uh, you know diffusion and the, and the dragging force becomes important, and you still have that gradient there. So in the end, you have the Brownian dynamic simulation, you know, used for those kind of things. <coughs> okay. So and and you can do the same thing, right? Essentially, you you can get a, capture the the correct rate. At least actually, the order of magnitude is right, and so on and so forth. There are many people. Like uh, Rebecca Wade and the, the gang and Andy McCammon's former postdocs and colleagues are working in, using this a lot. Now the question here is, uh, you know, how do you get that key parameter in, in either line driven dynamic or Brownian dynamic, the gamma, right? So, so how do you do? How do you how do you proceed? It turns out that this is actually a, if you first thing first you have to know that if you define your gamma that way, gamma being you know proportional to the velocity, if you define to use the dragging force this way, that means you know the, fr the, the friction, right? friction of wa water, defined this way, it's going to depend uh, strongly on the, the shape of the solute. You know, if you have a you know square or a circular or uh, ellipsoid and so on, and so forth, they all have a different gap. <laughs> That's very painful, right? You have every time you you come up with a water, you know, some uh, protein or something, nucleic acid, you have to really figure out what kind of gamma you have to use. Okay. So that is very painful. All right, <clears throat> and apparently it depends on the size of it. The bigger same object have a bigger friction. You know, it's not just proportional to the velocity. So that's something that you probably want to know before you actually gonna use Langevin or Brownian dynamic for your project. <clears throat> so, okay. So how would you do it? You know, actually, the thing that we know that is actually the viscosity of solvent pure neat solvent like water is actually constant. It's actually that if you define a viscosity in a proper way, it's a constant. It has nothing to do with solute. 
So how would you actually connect that thing that's universal to this sort of a system dependent? You know, we, in modeling, we always try to do something that is transferable, right? You, you study something on a small system, you, you apply it to a bigger complex system, and you can use the same number, you know, basically. That's the sort of a key thing that's important in, in modeling studies. So how many time I have? Sorry. <laughs> I, I have is it half of it? Okay. All right. So, so actually you can do it, and the, 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 actually the idea here is actually using the, basically you have to just go to the, you know, our continual modeling of water, basically how do you do it is essentially, it's called navy stokes equation, it's, it's just another way of rewrite the Newtonian equation, it's very scary looking, it uh, just means that, you know, there's a conservation of momentum, and conservation of mass, and everything settled, you have pressure apparently here, you know, if you still remember from college physics, Everything on the F is external force. You know, if you have water uh, interaction with protein, that would be part of it. So, if you have a rigid body, all right, and a sort of slow motion, and it's actually also solvent is sort of at some steady state, you get the so-called Stokes equation. Basically, you throw away all the thing on the left. All right. So, okay, and that become much simpler to do. So, and it's so simple that it's so so simple that there exists an analytical solution for the Stokes equation, you know, given an arbitrary dragging force, or like external force distribution, and it turns out to be just a transformation of that. So once you have the force and you get the velocity distribution of the fluid, and, you know, apparently this J here is actually, while well, the dirty detail is so-called defined by Austin, is actually termed Austin, you know, invented by Austin, apparently. So that, is apparently orientation, everything, you know, depend on spontaneous uh, position dependent. But it is actually going to be no close form. But if you actually think about this tumbling, you know, in general, you, if you're, you're, we're, you're, we're more interested in the uh, rotational, right? average effect, right? You don't care about the angular ro rotation with your frame of the coordinate. So if you look at that, it turns out to be much simpler. It's actually just like, a, you know, Green's function here. 1 over R, right? Green's function. This is basically what we use in, uh, in physics. And I here is just your identity matrix. It's a tensor, okay? So it's, it's very simple, all right? And uh, Hubbard, Hubbard and uh, Douglas in the, about uh, 20 years ago show that, you know, there's a very simple symmetry, right? Uh, the similarity between this, this uh, Stokes equation and, you know, if you remember from uh, physics, is similar to the Poisson's equation in, uh, in electrostatic. And you use that similarity and show that the, the dragging force on average, it's just linearly proportional to the velocity of the relative motion of the solid and solvent, and this gamma can be actually quantitatively figured out. It's related to the capacitor, capacitance of that object, whatever shape and size you have. And you know, it's essentially this has very simple definition with the, the actual electrostatic capacitance of that object and this. So that is actually how do you do it, okay? So once you have, that's why we actually use a linearly proportional dragging force in the Langevin dynamic, and we can figure out this gamma here. Okay, so it, it's size and shape dependent. All right, you can actually figure out, how, you can calculate this capacitance for arbitrary shape on the computer, so not a problem. Okay, given this, uh, <coughs> this introduction or background, essentially, what's the limitation here? The limitation of apparently using this Langevin model is that you have to have a rigid model, Right? So basically the solid molecule should be uh, rigid and this solid has to be like 100% uh, exposed, exposed to water. Right? So by basically what I'm trying to say here is that if you have buried uh, atom, you know, like typically in protein, right? you have buried atom in the water and you, you cannot just apply Langevin dynamics for everything. That's how we're doing it. It's so easy to do. Right? You just plug in a drug in force on every atom and every you know, random noise and you're done. And that's actually wrong. Okay, if you do that, you can go, go to your Amber package. I hope it's free, right? <laughs> you can use it. Amber sample is free, and then you can simulate Landry and Abbey. <laughs> you just do any high-quality crystal structure. You will never reproduce at least one thing that you cannot reproduce. That's very easy to get. It's a B factor. You cannot, if you actually do a uh, room temperature uh, water box simulator, you will get a decent B factor simulation, except the packing will change it. But more or less, the core part is actually basically qualitatively correct. 
the shape is right, but you cannot get it with lens okay? okay? So that is actually, you know, but if you actually using balance, you will get it. So that's something that is very interesting, even if you're wrong, okay? Without actually with any solvent. So dynamic is important there, you know, it's mostly the interharmonic motion there. So the goal here is that we're trying to develop some new dynamic uh, or something algorithm and based on this uh, NSE model, or uh, the Stoke equation, you know, under equilibrium case. And uh, when doing that, we, we actually also reduce the complexity of using the continuum wa water in dynamic simulations. And uh, that is part of how we implement it. It's so natural to simply treat water as fluid if you already treat it as a continuum. Right? Apparently, this is more interesting for multi-scale simulation that is uh, more complex, you know, lots of complex machinery with a reduced model of protein for nucleic acid. That's where this uh, kind of uh, strength will be, you know, long, longer time scale. So what is the model here? Okay, essentially, I just rephrased, right? Essentially, this is our model. It's just a navy stoke equation with, uh, you know, momentum of conservation and mass conservation. And to solve that is that you have a boundary condition, you know, partial differential equation, right? It's time-dependent PDE. And you you have a sort of the, you have a box right just like in the water simulation, and D you have a water box. You have a box, and you know you have to use some some model for that as a pipe flow for simplicity, and then you have a sort of water protein you know water interface condition. Basically, we just force balance you know on equilibrium or any time over time. It's the force going to be balanced right? So basically, all your hydrophobia force, uh, salvation you like to say is going to be there. All right, so you just solve it, you know, more PD to solve, solve velocity pressure, you enforce your conditions, and you update your interface. And you get everything from that. So we have some tests, you oh, know, it's a, it's a very, the early stage is more like a mass, right, how to solve that PD, right, time-dependent PD. It's a single air bubble, you know, we're not having any atom inside, it's just an ideal gas inside. And the equilibrium is just a, a unit of one, you know, you, everything is static. And we're doing the expansion and contraction to see, you know, whether we can capture the sort of common sense dynamic. So here is showing you the volume versus the time. You know, you see the, the first one is the, the over damped, heavily damped oscillation. This is essentially oh, you don't see the oscillation, right? Just essentially coming the volume is coming down to the equilibrium or increasing to the equilibrium. <coughs> and you have a sort of lightly damped oscillation, you see oscillation there different behavior. It's asymmetrical, right? You know, if you remember from gas law, you know, it's not equilibrium, I mean, not symmetrical. Expansion and contraction is not the exact opposite of it. So you do see the reasonable uh, capture of the common sense dynamic, all right? And, uh, okay, so the next thing that is actually more challenging is also sort of, you know, is relevant to us in recognition, right? You know, it's when, when atom or molecule contact each other, they're, they're going to forming one single solute as far as simulation is concerned. So how are you going to do it? So we're going to see that essentially in the first pr process, there are two, two separate bubbles, you know, they, they, they fuse together. You see the sort of the damping, the oscillation and stuff. And uh, you have the three more complex simulation. And the same thing, eventually they all should become one single drying air bubble. And we're capturing that. So uh, this is what we can do. We cannot do a separation. You know, there's no atom there. You know, I cannot drive single bubble and force them apart unless I have some atom there representing each bubble. Okay, uh, we're working on that. Right? So essentially, what we're working on is adding the uh, manual force, salvation force, and sort of you know to uh, to get this going. And uh, you know, this actually in center. So basically, uh, when you have this way, uh, the, the the setup this way, and then this. There's much fewer parameter in your model. You know, basically there's no radii anymore, and it's all coming from manual. And this is in regard is similar to rhythm. You know, this only the force will underlying force will determine your all of that. The only thing that is not there is actually something that is due to, you know, dynamic hydrophobic surface tension. Right? It's not actually something intrinsic to a, a force field. It's a, the due to motion of the water. Uh, we have an implicit water, so we have to define that. And you have a solvent probe, right? It doesn't know. You have to tell the program how how the smallest curvature of your of your interface. And also, it does not require prior knowledge. Like a member, if you have a member there, it's going to try to get the minimum energy, free energy interface. 
for your, once you have protein inserted, for example, it's no longer a slab. Uh, that will capture that. But uh, our job is not trying to reproduce that. We're more interested in the dynamic. Okay. All right, so that is uh, also very easy to implement. I mean, because just, you know, I cannot tell you the detail here. It's just you know, much easier to do if you treat it as a solute. And we're testing, we're going to apparently testing it on released molecule and see, and we compare with explicit world simulation and so on and so forth. And we're actually ex extending the algorithm to a second order, and we do have a much better, you know, smooth uh, dynamic. So basically, I, I finished my first part. Do I have a, how many minutes? Okay, good. So I think I can. Bye. Okay. So I can quickly go through that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you know, if you want to give a slow talk, that's what you have. <laughs> okay. Force field. Okay. Fine. Sort of the you know why, why, well, why we I'm the sort of in this first session you know continuum water force field right. So we're just, you know, we're talking about, you know, how, what's the right way to do it, reducing the degrees of freedom, and I said, we cannot do that. So even I'll tell you this, uh, you know, formal formulation, you cannot do it, you know, it's too slow uh, for most cases. So what we do is actually we're going to introduce more additional approximation. We want to make sure there's no structure, you know, no homogeneous structure, no structure, all right, the shape, size, the independent, you know, we don't care about that in the density fluctuation, so on and so forth. And, and once you have that, uh, you know, you also have the scaling issue to worry about since variable doesn't scale well. It's the same as, uh, you know, hydrophobic effect and all the electrostatic. So you have actually three parts in this uh, salvation free energy. Electrostatic, hydrophobic, and attractive interactions. Hydrophobic, uh, electrostatic usually we use uh, Poisson's equation, you know, classical electrostatic. Uh, Nonpolar, you know, repulsion, usually just a simple model proportional to volume or surface. Uh, manual is apparently, you know, you just integrate, right? You integrate your solvent volume and you'll get it, you know, basically. It's actually quite reasonable. You'll see. Okay, so how does it work? You know, we're testing it on real molecules, real proteins, and, you know, compared with explicit work simulation. This is just a sample of that. This is actually for the solid rate, apparently. And the manual is the same, similar system. And here it's actually showing you the, you know, if you do all that calibration right, you will get a very good agreement for the charging, electrostatic part. If you have the nonpolar, you know, hydrophobic part, you can also get, oh, this is actually manual. So if you actually compare with explicit water manual, you can also get a very good correlation there if you actually calibrate your model. So how about nonpolar uh, hydrophobic or repulsive part? And then you, for us, for small molecule, it seems like the, the volume is the best, best better uh, estimator or has a better correlation with the, with the entropy. It's just very simple, right? You know, if you look at the ideal gas, just means the ideal gas is good. It's very good for that kind of, you know, this is basically volume exclusion, right? You have insert some section there, molecule there. The first thing you're going to capture is really that part of the volume is not uh, accessible to water anymore. So that's the ideal gas, for, you know, volume exclusion, right? So you get it. So that's good enough. That's very good. You know, basically, we have a first order or zero order approximation that capture a big chunk of the physics. And how does it work well, you know? So basically, I'm comparing with the classical approach, meaning every, there's no separation between the hydrophobic and manual. You just have one parameter, capture everything. Have a very good correlation, it's actually with the collaboration with the, uh, Professor Peng Yu Ren right here. And you know, see the, this is actually it's four of the six systems we are studying together. And we're, we're essentially, you know, this is basically reproduction of the, some paper four years, three years ago. And if you do the same thing with this sort of a newer model, not very new, right, but it's a new work, and it, your correlation is slightly reduced and your range is reduced, and the reason for that correlation reduction is precisely due to the, uh, the range reduction. If you look at the experimental range, it's small, you know, apparently, right, binding for energy, tens of 20, at most 20 kT per mole, that's very strong interaction. But if you look at the, our original model, is humongous, it's like 30 kT per mole. Yeah, in that range, it's very big. So that big range gives you a very high correlation, higher correlation. And if you look at this uh, newer model, it gives you actually much more sensible range. It's closer to experiment, but still not there, because it's actually still approximation. Uh, okay, if you look at the RMSD, you know, if you compare it, you have a more like a more closer look in the agreement with the measurement, right? So basically, how do you, how does your model agree with the experiment? So if you look at the average error in this uh, 
uh, RMSC for the first model, classic model, you know, is an error in the always over 10 kK per mole to 15 kK per mole. If you look at the newer model, it's, it's a, you know, three times small. So basically what I'm trying to tell you here is that the error in the original classical model is mostly due to this, uh, you know, your emission of manual in this uh, hydrophobic effect with non-polar conditions. And if, if you capture that, you can dramatically improve your agreement with manual. And so the easier sell for other people who want to buy your story, why binding is better in this and that. And apparently the other thing, right, I haven't considered entropy here. I mean, you know, I think our initial work showed that entropy doesn't change the delta delta G that much. Maybe change the absolute value a little bit, but not the relative. Once again, the approximation. So to summarize, this part, uh, I have a very quick uh, talk on this. Skip, skip through, right? <coughs> Basically, uh, we, can, we show that a confirmation dependent energetic can be made consistent between the different models. If you continue, you can get it. And uh, you can, we show that whether you, all three parts of this uh, continuum model sh agree with, uh, agree with uh, sort of experiment uh, rigorous simulation. And, uh, and we can use a zero order approximation for repulsion hydrophobic effect and get a decent result. And finally, this one, when you apply it to binding, the mostly widely used model of this uh, in binding affinity calculation is really, you know, dramatically improve the value of binding affinity. And uh, I will just stop here and uh, Thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes. So have you ever uh, thought about uh, the generalized wrong conditions? I mean, the solution is some negative color map. Do you use it out of uh, right? Yeah, apparently, we're, we're, we're just starting, right? You know, we, we, we just finished max, essentially. <laughs> and uh, we, we'll start to look at the physics, you know, what kind of thing you can do. Definitely, you know, some very interesting. Yeah. I see in your first work, uh, the, uh, this, the, the advantage of this work is uh, it, it, it doesn't depend on the uh, solvent of your of, uh, of your set. Uh, so you don't have to like, uh, you know, every time you, you run laundry, you have to come up with a new parameter yes. or Brownian dynamics. So, so it even doesn't have to be a water or any other solvent. Oh, oh yeah, presumably, if I'm pure solvent, well, I, I, think, I think, you know, any homogeneous mixture, if you can well define a uh, viscosity of that solvent, you should be able to do it. Right? Yes. Or given the size, the issue here for the mixture is, what's your probe, <laughs> right? Yeah. You have, I don't know what's the probe, I guess you have an average probe. You still have, you know, ignore the sort of the low, or fine, fine grain time revolution, right? You know, yes. Apparently you're not, you don't care about those very fine details. Not just the probe, this, the shape of the solvent is also could be parameters in, in, in this model. Shape is hard. They think you know. Yeah. Think you know. Then it's really you have. It's, I think for for now you 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 ignore the shape. You just treat it as a cluster probe, right? So basically, you know, you cannot go anywhere inside. Otherwise, it's gonna squeeze in, you know, unless there are the overlapping there, even okay. the atoms of molecules. Okay, let's thanks uh, read again. Uh,